Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Wonderful. I am so incredibly honored uh, to be on the campus of this great historic university, uh, Hardin Simmons, on this wonderful evening. Um, to your president, uh, Dr. Bruntmeyer, uh, and to uh, Mary uh, Burke, and to the committee that organized the symposium and this week's activities, I am so incredibly grateful and would like to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, to Dean Ellis and the Logden Seminary family, thank you as well for your gracious hospitality during this time. Uh, it's been an incredible week. Uh, to the faculty, staff, and students of this wonderful university, again, thank you so much for the privilege of being here with you. Um, Again, I bring you greetings from Shaw University and Shaw University Divinity School, located in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, I'll say a little bit more in just a moment about our relationship and how we, in, in, in a real sense, are bound together uh, by a long and enduring legacy of the love of God in Christ, a uh, seed that was planted uh, by your founder, J.B. Simmons, uh, and our founder, um, Henry Martin Tupper, as well. Before we begin, I want to uh, share with you just a short video uh, that can tell you a little bit about who we are and um, the seed that was planted and now continues to flourish in Raleigh, North Carolina. When you look at this video, I want you to think about J.B. Simmons and the legacy that he laid and the proud heritage that you are a part of and, and how grateful we are in Raleigh, North Carolina because of the faithful service of your founder, J.B. Simmons. Uh, let us now watch this short video and then I'll begin my presentation. Thank you. Again, I am so honored to share with you a little bit about who we are uh, at Shaw University Divinity School. Um, the theme of my presentation uh, this evening is the World House, building communities of justice and reconciliation, uh, centered on the God who revealed God's self in Jesus Christ. I'm so excited because as we gather together tonight, uh, we pay tribute uh, in memory uh, of the legacy of James Barlow Simmons and his lovely wife, Mary Eliza Stevens. It is inspiring to know that the story of James and Mary Simmons intertwines once again with the story of their former colleagues, our founders, Henry Martin Tupper, and Sarah B. Leonard Tupper, who founded Shaw University in 1865. Amid the shadows of the Civil War and the war-torn lands of the Carolinas, 
Shaw University was born. And with the faithful support of J.B. Simmons in his role as recording secretary for the American Baptist Home Mission Society, it has flourished as the first and oldest historically black college and university in the American South. Leading to the founding of other great institutions like North Carolina Central University, Elizabeth City University, Fayetteville State University, and North Carolina A&T University. This year, Shaw University celebrates its 60th anniversary of the founding of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, affectionately known as SNCC, which played a crucial role in the Civil Rights Movement, leading to the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So indeed, friends, we have a proud and noble heritage. Each of you as students of Hardin-Simmons University should be very proud of your founding and the legacy that it continues to shine across this great late nation and the world. The world is indeed changing like never before. The dramatic advances in technology and science, mass digital communication, and transcontinental travel as well as globalization has made of our world a more deeper awareness of our differences and the cultural anxieties of reconciling those differences with our own unique stories and narratives as well. What is perhaps most alarming are the divisions within the Christian church in America today. Not that there has ever been uh, a uniformed uh, vision of the church, but the enduring divisions along race, gender, and increasingly sexual orientation is cause for serious consideration for church leaders. The politicalization of American evangelicalism has become of chief import even in this current historical moment when the nation is so deeply divided, politically and theologically. In terms of the church, perhaps the most divided hour in our faith communities occurs on Sunday mornings between the hours of 11 and 12 p.m. It exposes the great rifts that exist in the church and among faith communities. Whereas church and faith leaders are called to bear witness to the work of justice and reconciliation. It has, regrettably, in some sense, become followers of political discourse as the primary space for setting the cultural agenda of our nation. And it is always, friends, a dangerous proposition when faith and politics become too conflated together. The church must always stand as witness to the state, to be the prophetic conscience of the state, but never the servant or the midwife of the state. The gridlock in Washington, D.C. is a reflection of the profound racial, economic, and theological discourse experienced in the faith community today. In some sense, we must turn to the church and institutions of higher learning committed to the ways of God in Christ for wisdom, direction, and vision in these troubled times. Part of the challenge is overcoming the legacy of the modern pre preoccupation with categories and distinctions as the chief means of understanding the world. Hegel's philosophy of history and Rene Descartes' meditations are both classic examples as they celebrated the use of descriptive categories as a way of making sense of the external world. Categories around gender, race, ethnicity, religions, and cultures were born out of a vision of a world that could be best understood by attempting to interpret these concepts in concrete and enduring ways. As we have learned from that great philosopher, Michel Foucault, the moment we attach meanings to categories and concepts, such as race and a multitude of others, 
like white or black, or gay or straight, or slave or free, Jew, Christian, Muslim, etc. We engage in sort of a power play that has historically led to oppressive and dominating systems for the most vulnerable in our societies. So the categories we used use ought to be held with care and fluidity as a means of recognizing the historical and cultural context that have shaped our lives, but not as the final and ultimate ontological telos or the end of our existence. Furthermore, because of the dramatic rise of technologies, cyber communications, social media, and global travel, the world, Western culture in particular, is becoming more and more aware of the dramatic differences and ever-changing forms of diversity that is present in our world. The curious maze of differences invites anxieties, fear, and consternation by many in an attempt to stabilize our own narratives in terms of how we see uh, the world. And yet this year marks the 400th anniversary of the first 20 enslaved Africans that arrived along the shores of Port Comfort, Virginia. Echoing the 400 years of bondage of the Old Testament account of Egyptian captivity by the children of Israel. In this present moment, perhaps God is inviting us into a new discourse, a new language of peace and hope and radical inclusion, justice and reconciliation, rooted in the love of God in Christ, in the very Christus Libre. We are just one generation removed from the civil rights movement. It ushered in a new era, vision of the world house and beloved community. When in 1956, young Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. mounted the pulpit as a Baptist preacher from Georgia and assumed the call of ministry at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, a graduate of Morehouse College, one of the very institutions that was supported by J.B. Simmons, and the American Baptist Home Mission Society. Here King is, newly married, with a small newborn baby, and rose to the challenge sparking a spiritual and cultural revolution, calling America to live up to its ideals and to reach out toward a vision of human difference, to share at the table of brotherhood and sisterhood, to help realize the beloved community as an inspiration to present and future generations. I believe that King would have shared much in common with the prophetic imagination of J.B. Simmons, the abolitionary preacher, in their common belief in the dignity and sanctity of all human life, slave and free, male and female, Jew and Christian. In the last chapter of his last book entitled where do we go from here? Chaos or community? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about how we have inherited a great house, a world house, inhabited by all races, cultures, genders, ethnicities, and religions. And in this house, we must learn to live together as, as brothers and sisters or perish as fools. He talked about the need for global citizenship, the awareness of human interrelatedness, that we are all tied together by a single garment of destiny in terms of what Desmond Tutu called human interrelatedness. It's time, friends, perhaps to build the world house, an expansive vision of inclusivity, justice, and reconciliation. In what some describe as, as his last will and testament, King described it this way. He said, we have inherited a large house, a great house, in which we have to live together as brothers and sisters, black and white, Easterner and Westerner, Gentile and Jew, Catholic and Protestant, Muslim and Hindu. 
a family unduly separated in ideas, cultures, and interests, who because we can never live, we can never again live apart, must somehow learn to live together in peace. When J.B. Simmons and his wife, Mary Simmons, established Hardin Simmons University, I wonder if that's what they had in mind as they sought to build a great university on the farthest reaches of the untamed western frontier. As he envisioned a center of learning where all would be welcomed with the love of God in Christ. Perhaps the World House is a way of imagining a future that connects local and global communities where just and meaningful relationships in local communities serves as a basis for connecting with communities nationally and globally as well. is grounded in the sharing of stories and narratives, great acts of restorative justice that inform institutions and structures both locally and globally. The World House is a metaphor for envisioning a peaceful future of interrelatedness and mutuality. Whereas the old world was rooted in compartmentalization, distinctions, boundaries, and walls of difference, the new world of tomorrow will be fluid, interrelated, and in a constant state of change and transformation. So friends, perhaps now is not the time to build walls, walls of separation, hostility, fear, and rage. Perhaps now is the time to tear down walls and build houses, world houses of peace, justice, reconciliation, and human difference. Walls have never kept human beings, nations, or empires safe and secure. But only by building meaningful relationships and networks of mutuality, respect, and a celebration of human difference can we discover lasting peace, reconciliation, and enduring justice for future generations. Finally, friends, how do we move toward the world house and build communities of justice and reconciliation? In the Bible and rooted in Christian theology, the concept of justice and reconciliation goes hand in hand. There is justice, there is no justice without reconciliation, and there is no reconciliation without the presence of justice. God's justice is love, compassion, mercy, and truth, and hope. God's reconciliation is just, lovingly compassionate, and full of hope as well. It is the desire of God and the heart of God that God's children share in a common fellowship and community. So as we seek justice and reconciliation, the task of people of faith today is to arouse the moral conscience of our nation's friends expressed in local communities by attending to the great needs of the powerless, a radical embrace of the least and most vulnerable in our society, and perhaps becoming extremist for love and compassion as well. As I conclude, there are several ways to build the World House and advance communities of justice and reconciliation in our local communities and around the world. First, building the World House and communities of justice and reconciliation means engaging in a passionate and thoughtful educational program that introduces students of all ages to the urgent reality of human differences in the world and the inherent dignity of all human life. Children and adults of all ages need exposure and information about the histories, stories, narratives, cultures, and languages of human beings all around the world human beings who contribute greatly to the betterment of all human life on the planet Earth. Secondly, we must work hard to end the material condition of poverty and its relatedness to mass incarceration, living wage, and immigration reform, both in local communities and around the world. Because there is 
more than enough wealth in the world to make it so. The problem isn't a lack of wealth, friends, but the great unequal distribution of wealth and resources in the world. 2% of the nation's population holds 90% of the nation's wealth. The unequal distribution of resources created largely from the rise of globalization and global finance around the world continues to serve as a challenge for ending poverty in our world. And thirdly, we must forge communities of justice and reconciliation by forming bonds of friendship, mutual respect, dignity, and the sharing of stories. Ultimately, the critical question before the church and wider society is what does it mean to be a global citizen, sharing this planet together and to be faithful to the God of love and justice who demonstrates God's love in concrete and sacrificial ways. The ushering in of a new society is upon us, friends, a world of fluid consciousness where the production of knowledge and ideas is a function of shared, interrelated, active community created and sustained and shared by all. So let us, let us begin in our homes, in our classrooms, schools, communities, neighborhoods, with the power and grace of God in Christ, begin building the world house together, shoulder to shoulder, hand in hand, eye to eye and heart to heart. Thank you and may God bless you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that question. Um, we wouldn't be uh, here, uh, I wouldn't be at Shaw, had it not been for J.B. Simmons and his work as recording secretary and his conversations and dialogue with Henry Martin Tupper and his wife, Sarah Leonard Tupper. Henry Martin Tupper uh, was a Civil War veteran, came down as part of a missionary effort to Raleigh, North Carolina in the wake of the Civil War. Uh, he gathered together uh, students uh, both preachers and, and other leaders uh, to form the Raleigh Institute in the basement of a church that they formed together in the city of Raleigh. And uh, after many years went by, they continued in their persistence. Uh, the story is told that uh, there are some accounts when Henry Martin Tupper had to hide his students in the cornfields uh, to uh, get away from the raids from the Ku Klux Klan who didn't want students to learn uh, about the Bible. But he remained steadfast and committed and continued his conversation, his dialogue, and his work uh, with the American Baptist Home Society and with J.B. Simmons uh, and his lovely wife, lovely wife Mary uh, to find funding and resources to elevate uh, this Raleigh Institute, which was simply a gathering of people to learn and study the Bible, uh, to actually become a real college uh, university uh, with other programs that included education, uh, programs for teachers and nurses as well. Uh, it continued, it changed its name through the benefactor of Shaw in the, about the 1870s, but continues to flourish even to this day. So uh, that's a, a living example of your first point there at your conclusion about uh, the importance of educational programming to face the urgent realities of our of our day thank you 
Well, I wonder if, uh, if, if you have a, a question that you would like to ask, a topic that you would like for uh, Dr. Hill to discuss a bit more in relationship to these ideas. Yes, Stan. Great, awesome question. Uh, I, I think one of the purposes of education is to uh, help students to become more aware of their own story. Uh, I think it was Socrates who said that the beginning of wisdom is uh, knowledge of self. That to know thyself is the beginning of wisdom. And so my journey from um, uh, being raised on the, the edge of an old plantation in the belly of the south uh, with working class roots, my father was a sanitation worker, not unlike the sanitation workers that Martin Luther King Jr. marched with uh, in Memphis, Tennessee in 1968, just before he died. Uh, my mother uh, cleared bedpans and ser served the sick and dying in the uh, city's nursing home. And these, um, these experiences shaped and formed me with a deep commitment to service, giving back, and also I grew up in a small Baptist church as well. So the church was called Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, at the time when I was baptized, they didn't have an indoor uh, warm pool. They had a, uh, a nice little area outside uh, where we would go. And it was a very cold morning in the, in the spring uh, when I was baptized. These experiences shaped my foundation and outlook in the world. Uh, I always had an awareness that I could do and be anything that I wanted to be uh, because although we may have been poor, we didn't know we were poor because we were loved. And I think one of the misconceptions about the condition of poverty is that there's an assumption that there's an absence of dignity and complexity in the nuance of life. There's love, there's heartache, there's triumph, there's hope, there's vitality as well. Um, but I've had the honor and the privilege of, uh, on the one hand, growing up in a small uh, community on the dirt road in the edge of an old plantation in the belly of the south, to walk in the streets of Soweto in South Africa, Cape Town, Johannesburg. Uh, I served four and a half years in the U.S. Army and walked the streets of Seoul, Korea uh, as a young soldier before uh, getting out of the military and attending college in Atlanta. What I found uh, uh, in my travels all around the world is that fundamentally human beings are, are, are the same, that we are all basically the same um, inside and our consciousness, our aspirations, and our desires. And the challenge is, is that the language that we use often prohibits our ability to imagine uh, an awareness of the dignity of, of, of the other. That we're so wrapped up in these categories of whiteness and blackness that we assume that somehow that becomes the way that we, we understand and interpret the world when there's so much more to who we are than just the color of our skin or our genders or sexual orientation and that sort of thing. And so I think we're now in an era where we have to grapple with these differences because it's now so compelling that it's impacting our corporate, uh, political, cultural, economic lives together. Yeah, absolutely. I, I believe the, 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 the primary thing that we can do to end poverty in terms of what 
what I do is education. I think that education is the absolute key uh, to addressing the issue of poverty on a global scale. We have to raise up a new generation of leaders who are faithful, who are courageous, and who are prepared, and who have the nuance and the understandings of the condition theologically, economically, uh, and culturally in order to grapple with these issues uh, on a global scale. So Shaw University Divinity School and Shaw University has been a part of the uh, Moral Mondays movement and the movement led by Reverend William Barker, who received the Genius Award uh, just recently. He has uh, uh, been at the forefront with uh, the, the movement called the Poor People's Campaign uh, and the Repairs of the Breach. Repairs of the Breach and Poor People's Campaign are two initiatives that are perhaps most out front uh, in today's time. And we've had students who have marched and participated in these demonstrations and programs uh, since the very beginning with the Moral Mondays movement and even in the present uh, day with the um, repairs of the breach. But uh, I, I love William Barber. Uh, I think that even, uh, you know, some of our political leaders are great, uh, but we have to be about the business of looking beyond the present moment. And I believe uh, that we do that by forming leaders who can reach out beyond the generations to have an impact. And that's what I'm so, I'm so excited about with, with, with J.B. Simmons uh, and also Henry Martin Tupper because they had an awareness and I believe it was the Holy Spirit that guided them in that awareness that shaping and, and training and forming leaders has a, a, a reverberating impact. So it's great to be an activist and be out on the front lines but when you can shape and form hundreds of leaders, thousands, the influence of J.B. Simmons, Henry Martin Tupper, and other founders has led to the impact of shaping hundreds of thousands of leaders who have gone out and shaped the world and made a difference for Christ. Thank you, sir, for that, that wonderful question. And that's a tough question because theology, um, for the young folks in here, theology is God talk. It just has to do with talking about God, language about God. But theology has been so policed out of the, the mainstream discourse that it's very difficult to talk about God in the public square. Uh, the evangelical right has sort of kind of police the concept to an extent that it's very difficult to talk about the love of God, uh, to talk about how God wants us to love all human beings and, and to challenge some of the political uh, practices that sort of compete against the language of the love of God in Christ in the world. Uh, Martin Luther King talked about the love ethic of Jesus and he used this concept of the love ethic to gauge ideas as to whether they're actually uplifting humanity or, or diminishing humanity. So the love ethic of Jesus, according to Martin Luther King, would be an interpretive tool to see whether po policies or issues are actually consistent with the teachings of Christ or, or not. And one way to know is whether they're life-giving or whether they take away life. So if there's a policy or an issue that gives life, that gives joy, peace, happiness, uh, or if there's an issue or policy that takes away life, uh, that's one way of determining whether it is consistent with the, with the love of, of, of Jesus Christ and the, 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 the God who revealed God's self in Jesus Christ. But I still think there's a role for theology I really truly believe in my heart that what we need is more theology in the public square and not an absence of theology in the public square. We just need more folks who are actually conversant in theology who can speak about the connections between theology and public policy, theology uh, and cultural issues, and to be able to talk fluently about God and the will of God in the world uh, without um, sort of feeling uh, uh, uneasy uh, about the, uh, the other sort of secular language that's out there.
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that question. Um, this is a very interesting time to be alive, uh, especially to be young, because, uh, you know, this generation, many of you uh, were probably born, what, in the late 90s, maybe the early 2000s, 2001, something like that, which is crazy because some of us have shoes and clothes older than you, um, <laughs> right? Um, but what's fascinating is that you are a generation that has come of age uh, in the, uh, the age of social media. And you have more access to information than any generation ever known to humanity. No other generation in the history of humanity has had access to as much information as your generation does through your smartphones and digital devices. And because of these digital devices, you now have a window into a world that was off limits to generations before you. Uh, you can now, uh, through uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Google, have access to, to, to uh, cultures near and far. Uh, you have access to languages, to dress, to clothing, art, music, literature, all around the world. So the challenge of your generation, this generation, I would argue, uh, isn't the, 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 the lack of information. The challenge of this generation is how to navigate the overabundance of information that you do have. And I would argue that you have to really be, come to grips with what's important for you. What are your values? What kind of human being do you want to be in the world? What kind of legacy do you want to leave? And let that be your guiding sort of uh, barometer and compass as to how you navigate this great world of information and media. Because if you don't, you can get lost. It's just kind of like a sea. All of that information is kind of like a big ocean. If you don't have an anchor or a boat, you can easily get lost and tossed around uh, to and fro. So it's important to have a sense of, of how you're going to anchor yourself uh, in this maze of information that's out there. I'll try one. I'm, I'm, I'm curious as how you would respond to sort of the tension between difference and unity. As, as you're talking about the exposure of so much diversity in the world, we sometimes think unity depends upon sameness, which of course is not going to happen. So how do we work within the context of difference in a way that leads us to reconciliation? Thank, thank you so, so, so very much. I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions, is that we assume that uh, in order to reconcile our differences, we have to agree and share the same ideas and outlooks and uh, common uh, commitments together. But I believe that in today's time, there's some differences that we have to live with that will never go away. Uh, we have to, to live and to exist in the midst of those differences. But what we can do is be very aware of our own stories and engage in dialogue and conversation with differences. So I think dialogue becomes the groundwork, the, the, the glue, the, the, uh, the, 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 the foundations for engaging in the work of reconciliation. And so I believe that reconciliation is not an end or a goal, but reconciliation is a process. Reconciliation is an orientation. It is a way of approaching uh, the other. It is a process where dialogue becomes your first instinct rather than separation and division. Dialogue becomes the fluid connection between uh, the self and, and the other. We lose nothing by engaging in dialogue with someone else. In fact, in many accounts, we learn more about ourselves as we engage in conversation and dialogue with someone who's different from us. That's what I've learned in my journey. And I think it's compelling when we look at the Christian narrative. Jesus talked to everyone, but it didn't mean that Jesus agreed with everyone that he talked to. So I think it's sometimes helpful to understand that it's not about necessarily agreeing, but engaging in thoughtful dialogue with the intent to learn, to understand, to explore, rather than simply to, to reinforce your own uh, views and ideas. Uh, 
Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. So at Shaw University Divinity School, uh, we have uh, about a hundred uh, students. We offer the Master of Divinity degree and the Master of Art in Christian Education degree. About 60 percent, 60, 70 percent of our students are training to be pastors. They are preparing to serve congregations and to go out and to engage in some form of ministry. Then we have students who are serving as working to, to, to serve as chaplains or to form non nonprofit organizations or to go in Christian, into Christian counseling, pastoral care and, and counseling. Some go on into the academy, uh, but most of our students are preparing for ministry in the church and to serve in some, some area of ministry in, in, in the world, uh, missions and, and, the, and the like. And we've been training and forming uh, leaders uh, in ministry since the founding of the institution in 1865. Uh, we continue to do so. We are an objective of the General Baptist State Convention of North Carolina. So the General Baptist State Convention of North Carolina uh, is our chief partner. Uh, they work with us to ensure that we're uh, supported and able to stay alive and, and flourish. Yes, sir. I think there's another question. Well, I, I think that's a really, really good, good question. Um, what I try to do, especially with students in class, is really seek to first understand the traditions uh, and, and, and the role that they play for those communities. Now, there is such a thing as a tradition and a history of, 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 of heresy and the language of heresy within Christian discourse historically. That language has not been sort of heard too much nowadays because there's so many differences and so much diversity within the Christian church and within the larger global sort of traditions of, of, of the Christian narrative. So I'm very, very reluctant uh, to condemn uh, you know, religious traditions uh, on the surface until I, I have a full understanding of what they mean and, 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 the, and their, their particular currency among the communities that they serve. So we teach and we affirm what's called contextual theology uh, at Shaw University Divinity School. We try to teach students to appreciate the context of ideas rather than super, uh, sort of, so superimposing our views on those particular communities. But that's a really, really good question, and I think that's something that the church definitely has to grapple with. Okay, I have another. I could spend, we could spend the evening here talking. Um, it seems that in our day, we are seeing some overt expressions of racism in ways that we haven't seen in recent years. I'm thinking about Charlottesville. And um, I, I'm, I'm curious, is this a, a new a rising of racism that we should uh, see as something new or is it something that's been under the surface that is just expressing itself in different ways and, and what is what is behind these kinds of new frightening expressions of racism well I, I think that's a really really good question and uh, I remember a quote from Dr. King who would say that the moral arc of the universe is long but it bends towards justice. That the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And then he would quote a famous poem by James Russell Lowell, though the cause of evil may prosper, yet tis truth alone that's strong, though her portion be the scaffold and, a, and upon the throng be wrong, yet that scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch above his own. So I think that what we're seeing is a backlash to the Obama administration. Uh, it's very difficult to understand what's happening today and the rise of white nationalism, white supremacy, and the resurgence of this kind of venomous uh, anger and resentment apart from the Obama administration in 2008 uh, through 2016. And so I think it's important to recognize that 
progress in human history tends to ebb and flow. It tends to have peaks and troughs. We saw a similar backlash to the civil rights gains in 1968. So with the assassination of Dr. King on April 4th, 1968, uh, we saw an incredible backlash from 68 to about 75 until the election of, of uh, Jimmy Carter. God bless Jimmy Carter, uh, by the way, uh, as he heals and continues his, his legacy and his work. But I think what we're seeing today is a tremendous backlash to the, um, to the, uh, the, the presumed gains of the Obama administration. And how compelling was it uh, when an African-American man stood up to take the mantle of presidency in this nation. Imagine what it must have felt like to those who had no awareness of a nation that that that, that would have a, a black president. And so I think the nation is going through a very, very difficult transition, but the, the, the browning of America is upon us. Uh, we've already, you know, we're very aware of the data and the statistics. Uh, it's going to be very hard to stop that. And I think that what we're seeing now is just an incredible backlash as we're seeing the rise and the impact of globalization and the browning of America on the backdrop of a long history of white male dominated leadership in the country. And so I think that, that some surprising things may happen. We just have to hold on to our seat. And I think the Christian church has to be faithful. The question is not about being successful, but what does it mean for the church and people of faith to be, uh, to be faithful during this time? Could you, could you give maybe concrete illustrations of how we can be faithful within our churches with regard to the rise of, of racism? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, that, that it all begins in local communities, that all politics is local. And having the courage to show kindness, you know, I think kindness is a very lost art today. Learning how to be kind to one's neighbor who may be different from you is one of the small yet simple and compelling uh, practices that individuals and communities can embody as we share the love of God in Christ. So with J.B. Simmons and Christus Liebe, I believe that's, that's it. The love of Christ. I think he got it right when he said, you know, if we can learn how to just simply share the love of Christ with our neighbors and with our friends, with those who we meet in the marketplace, in the coffee shops, who we pass by in the hallways and in the classrooms, if we can share the love of Christ uh, with gentleness and compassion and with kindness, then that begins to lead a ripple, leave a ripple effect that could reverberate throughout history. We never know who we might be kind to and who might need that kindness for, new, for, for, for a new, new uh, sense of inspiration in their own life. Well, I mentioned Mikhail Foucault in, 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 my, um, in my presentation, and Mikhail Foucault um, did a lot of research on the penitentiary and prisons and the idea of those kind of, um, of, of institutions that are often used as sort of systems of, of power and control. Really what it has to do, with, do is, is with control and with the policing of, of bodies it's about the policing of black and brown bodies uh, in American society in terms of mass incarceration. Uh, you mentioned uh, the death penalty. I just don't think we, we, we are um, wise enough as a society uh, to make those kinds of determinations. It doesn't work. Uh, research has shown that, uh, that the death penalty isn't a, a deterrent uh, and that it's costly to taxpayers and that it's irreversible when we're finding out that new uh, DNA and technologies are proving otherwise. So if there's one case throughout history that has reversed a decision, that's enough to say that we're not prepared to do the final act 
uh, because we just don't know enough. We don't have enough information and it's not a deterrent. Uh, but the Bible teaches us that an eye for an eye leaves everyone blind. And so I'm not sure that that's something that we want to uh, continue to embody as a society. I'm against the death penalty uh, categorically. Secondly, I think with mass incarceration, we know for a fact that, uh, you know, uh, one in every three African-American males are either in jail, uh, you know, getting ready to get out of jail or getting ready to go to jail uh, as a product of the breakdown of the family. But these are systematic uh, efforts. In 1965, over 70% of African-American households uh, had both parents. And the incarceration rate was uh, uh, just a, a fraction of what it is today. So we have to look at the policies, the three strikes you're out, uh, the decline of, the, of, of, of priority, prioritizing education and inner city programs and joblessness and homelessness that are all factors that have contributed to uh, mass incarceration along with the over policing of black and brown neighborhoods that contributes to, to mass incarceration as well. So if they look at the systemic uh, structures that contribute to mass incarceration and there's a wonderful book uh, by Michelle Alexander called The New Jim Crow that is a textbook that I think everyone should take a look at. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Hill, for being here this week, for your presentation tonight, for the richness of the dialogue, for your willingness to speak prophetic truth with the love of Christ and with truth. We appreciate you very much. Would you like to express appreciation to him? We are so grateful to uh, the organizers of this event, uh, to Rich Trailer and to Mary Burke and other members of the committee who have arranged for the wonderful experiences that we've had this week. And they've also arranged for food. Uh, across the hall, we have in the reception room some refreshments for you. Yes, good. Um, thank you, uh, Dean Ellis and Dr. Hill. Thank you all for being here. Um, as Dean Nelson just said, we do have snacks in the back, so help yourself. But while you're there, I encourage you to continue this conversation. Something that I kept hearing over and over in my head throughout this whole of night were those two questions James Simmons asks of us. What is the greatest thought that is occupying your mind? And what is your duty towards fulfilling it? So think on that. What is that thought in your mind? All right, is it, what is your call to action and how are you going to get that action done? All right, so again, thank you both so very much and uh, y'all go eat, thank you.